Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Full Disclosure. And today we've got an amazing guest who is a leading authority in the oil and gas industry. And our and our discussion today is all about the future of oil and gas. In other words, fossil fuels, right? And everything related, but also probably most importantly, how you can make money investing in that area. And I personally believe this could be a great time to get into oil and gas as an investment. And we'll certainly talk about that. So it's an absolute honor to have our guest with us today. Folks, here we go. If you have concerns about your financial future, let's be honest, the world shapes your wallet. We're taking you behind the scenes to look at what's really happening in the real world. Inform, prepare, and empower. This is the Full Disclosure Podcast with your host, John McGregor. Before we get into it, don't forget to ring that bell below and hit subscribe. I've got a loaded lineup of very successful and powerful experts like today showing you exactly how to make money in various asset classes, no matter what's going on in the economy. So make sure you hit subscribe. And by the way, next week, we've got a 30-year Wall Street veteran who has consistently brought accurate insight and forecast into the market. So if you have a 401k, you have an IRA or just investments, or you're interested in the stock market, you'll definitely want to hear what he has to say. Also, I wanted to mention, as always, my cash flow masterclass is up on my website. It's been extremely popular. It's roughly 35 minutes, so it's not too long. And I teach you a very simple wealth building strategy using stocks and options. Very simple strategy to generate instant cash flow on every single trade. And by the way, this is not day trading. This is a well proven strategy. And all I did was I codified it into a step by step process that many people use, yet sadly, I'd say 98 probably 99% actually, people have no idea it exists. And it's a strategy where you can literally create a pension for life. And and as I often say, it's the exact same strategy my 93-year-old father uses to this day to generate <laughs> fifteen to $20,000 per month as a hobby. And he's been doing it consistently for the past 12 years. And by the way, I just looked at his 2023 monthly income report. And there were several months where he he was he did north of twenty five thousand. So check out the masterclass. It's on my website, and I think you'll find it interesting. All right, so let's get into it. It's an honor and privilege for me to introduce my good friend Mike Maselli to the show. And Mike is the CEO at REI Energy. It's a privately owned oil and natural gas exploration and production company headquartered in Richardson, Texas. They specialize in acquisition, development, and management of oil and gas projects, starting all the way back in 1987. And Mike, I just read, in the 36 years in business, your company has operated and acquired interests internationally, offshore, and in over 3,000 wells in 11 states domestically. I mean, it's incredible. You're in Louisiana, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma. But the one thing that caught me by surprise is you're in California. I didn't think you'd be allowed in California, frankly. (laughs) (laughs) Because because as a resident of California myself, I'm afraid one day I'm going to be arrested for mowing my lawn with a gas-powered mower. So (laughs) so, uh, that's interesting. I'd love to hear that. But um, you've also set some amazing drilling records that I'd love for you to share. Um, And by the way, like, like myself, Mike is a personal advisor to Robert Kiyosaki. And Mike and I actually... One of the last times I saw Mike, we did a course together at Arizona University, Arizona oh, yeah. State University. Yeah, and uh, and that was a great time. Um, oh, and lastly, sorry, before I turn the mic over, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Mike has a very popular podcast called the REI Energy Show on the Rich Dad channel, which is a great show, a phenomenal show. If you want to learn how to make money in oil and gas, save a ton on taxes, generate cash flow. So definitely check that out. So, Mike, with all that, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you so much for your time. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because it's so timely. Well, thank you for inviting me, John. I mean, this is a real pleasure, and uh, I hope I can share some insight with your listeners and, you know, educate people a little bit about oil and gas and, you know, how, what the what the outlook is for our industry. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, that's exactly where we went ahead. So I, I think for starters, Mike, why don't we kick it off and share just a little bit more about yourself, your background, um, how you got started, why you, why you picked the oil and gas industry, and maybe where your company is today. Well, I actually started in the industry, you know, back in 1976. I started working for some uh, oil and gas companies. I grew up in Mississippi, and uh, 
moved to Texas in 1980, and of course that's when oil prices had reached about $47 a barrel. So it was in an industry that I knew quite a bit about. I worked for a company which was a midstream company, which is a company that basically managed pipelines, mm-hmm. uh, which was Tennessee Gas or Tenneco. And they had offered me a full-time position when I got out of college, but um, I, you know, I, I wanted to get out of Mississippi, so I ended up moving to Texas and uh, started working for some small independent companies, and uh, primarily up in North Texas. And and then from there, we went over to Louisiana and uh, you know drilled some very deep, expensive wells. And I uh, also have drilled in Argentina. We drilled the deepest discovery in the country of Argentina at. Wow. You know, uh, we took a two million acre concession up in the Northwest Basin, which was about 32 miles into the rainforest. And, you know, it's a real interesting story because uh, not only, you know, was it was it adventurous, it was also a story that really taught me a lot about oil and gas. I mean, growing up here in the United States, I mean, we're all accustomed to flipping a light switch and the lights mm-hmm. come on or, you know, we've got hot water to take showers. And, you know, when you're working in an area that is a very remote area, it, you don't really realize how v- valuable good reliable energy is to people. I mean, you know, I was sitting, I remember sitting in, in, in a town there in Argentina, and of course the lights kept going on and yeah. off, and you know, because they were having brownouts, kind of like California is starting to have now. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> You know, they were having brownouts, so, you know, I was talking to some of the to some of the people there, and they were telling me that, you know, they've actually had people that have died on the operating table because they, they just yeah. didn't have access to, to, to good, reliable energy. So it really made me wake up and kind of realize why, you know, we, we do what we do in our business and why we search for oil and gas. And and uh, so it was, a, it was a great experience. And then, of course, you know, we drilled in Canada. I've drilled on shore offshore uh over my i've been in the business for about 40 years so mm-hmm. you know i've seen a lot of it then more recently in the last 10 or 12 years you know we primarily focused on the Bakken shell up in north dakota and also in oklahoma the cherokee shell and uh, different shell plays in texas well you've definitely seen it all i don't know any oil exp- any, anyone more of an expert in oil than in, in gas than you. So it's like I said, it's a privilege to have you. You guys have done so much. So I guess my first question is, what is the state of the oil industry now? Well, despite the current administration trying to put us out of business, actually, you know, they've caused prices to spike. Uh, I think here in the United States, we're we've we are now producing close to 13.2 million barrels of oil a day, which is really a record. Mm-hmm. And it's surprising, you know, because this administration, in fact, the Energy Information Administration, they're predicting that we'll produce over 13.4 million barrels a day next year. So companies are still pushing forward. Now, where the government has stepped in and they've tried to, you know, basically has this war on hydrocarbons to push this green energy, you know, uh, agenda, uh, they are now, you know, obviously they're able to control the drilling offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not issuing new permits. Now, when large companies go to drill oil and gas wells, you know, they're looking for billion barrel fields. I mean, they're not looking for smaller fields like a lot of the independents and, and so, you know, really stopping permitting offshore is going to have a massive effect as we move forward. Because when you got a company like Exxon or some of the larger companies, when they're discovering oil today, you know, they 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 usually it's a, got a ten year outlook of when that oil is finally going to hit the hit the market. Mm-hmm. So what a lot of people don't realize, you know, is all this this the the the, the push to for this green energy has been it's it's really going to hamper us in the future and cause even higher prices. So, Mike, why would an oil company like Exxon take on a major project when Biden himself said that you've got nothing to worry about? You've got 10 years before we shut down oil and gas. It's crazy. Yeah, it really is. And it makes you wonder that these politicians actually believe that, Uh, you know, because when you, you know, First thing that comes to people's mind when they when they talk about oil and gas is they're they're thinking about gasoline. They're thinking about yeah. gas powered cars. Yeah, right. But really, 
you know, when you look at fossil fuels overall, I mean, there's over 6,000 products that are made from fossil fuels. I mean, you have, you know, when, when, when you build electric cars, I mean, that they use fossil fuels to build electric cars. I mean, you have to mine somewhere about, I think it's a half a ton of, yep. of rare earth materials to even make a battery. And uh, that takes diesel fuel. That takes heavy equipment. That takes, you know, uh, so when they, when they go to build these electric cars, they're using a lot of fossil fuels. People that have their cell phones, there's a lot of fossil fuels that are used in manufacturing your cell phones. So to say that you're going to do away with fossil fuels and, you know, we're going to completely stop using them in 10 years is ludicrous. I mean, it's just not going to happen. No, no, no question know. about it. I mean, the shirt I'm wearing, uh, my reading glasses, the car I drive, how I heat my home, this microphone, oil was used to build these products. So yeah. how in their right mind do they come out and say, we are ending fossil fuel? I mean, <laughs> Joe Biden, on the very first day of president that he took office, he killed the, the Keystone Pipeline. That crushed 12,000 jobs with a swipe of his pen, eliminating a very clean way to transport oil as opposed to a train or a truck. It just goes, it goes against all common sense. I don't know a single president that on the first day of the job killed 12,000 jobs. I mean, it's just <laughs> unbelievable. You can't do that if you tried. So, so Mike, given all the uses of, of oil and natural gas for everything that we use and consume, how can they possibly say they're getting rid of oil and gas? I don't get it. I think a lot of these politicians don't really believe that, John. I think a yeah. lot of them are, are pushing for their donor base to give them money. You know, you have a lot of these green groups out there that donate money. I mean, I think when it comes down to it, there are some very smart people in politics. You know, Joe yeah. Biden obviously may not be one of them, but, <laughs> but as far as as far as some of the rest of the people, I mean, there's some pretty smart people out there that understand that fossil fuels, because if you just take green, just take wind and solar, you know, wind and solar. If you look at it, I mean, that's all it. Uh, that's all it's going to do is just generate, uh, and you know, random power. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you know, it takes fossil fuels to generate the equipment that build the build the wind system. So, wind and solar really doesn't have any upside besides just generating electricity. You know, fossil fuels. You know, it's basically all of its products are used in everything that we use on mm -hmm. a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. to say that you're going to completely get rid of fossil fuels is is, is just not, is just crazy. So, given all this, Mike, given the basically this tug of war between the Biden administration or the left and reality, um, you say, you know, and I've said that I've seen this before. We are at record levels in production in terms of oil. What is your outlook? What do you see going forward? Because right now oil is sitting around seventy one dollars a barrel, which is kind of low relative to, to where it was. Um, what's your outlook? Well, I think that, you know, prices are going to stay, you know, in the 70 to 80 dollar range. Uh, you know, regardless of what people say, that uh, a lot of the prices are dictated by OPEC. Mm -hmm. uh, OPEC is, you know, they want to keep Brent prices. Brent crude is what, you know, obviously worldwide crude. They want to keep that around $80 a barrel. So I think you're going to continue to see, and hopefully we're going to get a new administration in that, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, is not going to, you know, just have this dire effect on killing the oil and gas industry. Uh, so I, I think overall, regardless of what happens, you know, fossil fuels is going to continue to be. Now, are electric cars going to, to, to grow? I don't know. People don't want them. They're not mm -hmm. able to sell them. Yeah. You know, I think in the long run, you may see more of a hybrid type car that basically has electric and also uses a combustion engine, which makes more sense to me. Uh, but I think in the overall big picture, I mean, you're going to see the hydrocarbon industry. I mean, I think the EIA, which is, you know, kind of the Bible of the oil and gas industry, they're predicting that oil and gas is going to be the number one fuel, fuel used to generate electricity for the next 30 or 40 years. Yeah, so you, you mentioned hydrocarbon. I mean, I just read today there's a new discovery, a major hurdle in hydrogen, hy, hydrogen, excuse me, energy, um, hydrogen energy, and it's a breakthrough basically, marking a huge step towards viable hydrogen energy, a viable hydrogen energy economy. So it just blows my mind that we are spending 
trillions of dollars to go net zero, basically, and the fossil fuel industry. We're setting up these charging stations for a car nobody wants. Um, and to your point, I, I think if there was a push for hybrid cars, that totally makes sense. We own one, but pure electric is insane. Report came out today that the new Tesla truck, which I, by the way, just saw one for the first time. It's a really cool looking truck. Really? <laughs> way, way better than the picture. I was actually, I was actually impressed because the pictures do not do justice. But, but now it's having a horrible time in the snow, as other electric vehicles do. Their charging goes down way. In fact, we live here in a small town called Auburn, and it's in between uh, San Francisco and Tahoe. So all the rich Bay Area people drive through this town on their way to skiing and there's a charging station near a bowling alley and every time i see it there's just lines lined up of teslas and people <laughs> sitting there not only to get to the charging station but once they get there it's another 45 minute wait to charge their vehicle and they've only driven two hours or an hour maybe an hour and a half from the bay area to get there then they already have to stop and charge to make a short story long this ev push is insane plus the environmental damage as you alluded to is crazy in terms of the mining that's required, the child labor that's required, the amount of oil is required. What's yeah. your take on this whole EV push? Because it's happening here in California and other blue states. Newsom said uh, no more gas powered or combustion engines by 2030. They're basically phasing out combustion engine trucks and requiring them to be EVs. And by the way, these EVs, they are so heavy that if you get too many in, a, in an old parking garage, they will collapse because they were not designed to ha handle this type of weight. You can't, it's, well, you can, but it's getting very expensive to insure them because the repair costs are so high, because very few mechanics know how to repair them. And then when you do, the costs are great, like replacing a battery costs more, well, not more, but you know, in the 20s to $25,000. So what's your take on this whole thing, Mike? Well, like yourself, I'm, you know, I'm privileged to talk to a lot of very smart people, you yeah. know, on my podcast. And <clears throat> one of the big discussions we always have is about electric cars and, you know, where we're going. And, and it's like, like you said, you know, I mean, obviously people don't want them. Now, are the wealthy going to own a second car that's going to be electric? I think in the end, that's what you're going to see because the normal person or the person that's not, you know, obviously very wealthy. I mean, who can afford a $70,000 right. Tesla? Right. So, you know, I, I don't see how people like, you know, Gavin Newsom and some of these other governors that are saying that they're going to go all electric, uh, you know, because obviously the grid can't handle it. Yep. You know, not only that, you know, these cars are very flam flammable. And uh, they obviously, as you saw well, after the hurricane hit down in Florida, a lot of these cars were submerged by salt water and a lot of them caught on fire and burned. Right. And you can't just put them out. Well, that's right. I mean, they, they sit there and burn and they not only burn their car, but, you know, in the parking garages where they got wet at, they also burned the house down. So they're very combustible, you know, these batteries. And, and another point that you just alluded to is that, you know, the weight of these cars, I mean, what kind of, you know, it's going to have a tremendous effect on our roads, our buildings, our infrastructures, our parking garages. I mean, in fact, I've heard of companies that are that are going to start banning these cars from actually parking in parking garages because mm. they weren't built for that. I mean, you start putting in a you know a bunch of five thousand pound cars or ten thousand pound cars. I don't know what that Tesla truck weighs, but I would imagine yeah. it's not not very light. I know the. Uh, so it's 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 just ridiculous, and it was done backwards. That's why what makes me believe it's it you know it was more of a a uh, a deal to obviously there's somebody making a lot of money out there yeah. off of EVs, and yeah. you know they're using our tax dollars. I mean it's 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 basically theft of the of the taxpayer, and uh, to to do something because they did it backwards. I mean if you're going to actually build this out, you should have went out and built out, built out the infrastructure first. You know, and put in the charging stations first before you go out and just put a bunch of cars on the road that there's no place to charge them. Yeah, and these policies always screw the little guy, right? The middle yeah. <laughs> class, lower class income person, they always are the ones that get screwed in the end. So, yeah. so Mike, the big question is, how dirty is oil and gas to the environment? How do you answer that? Well, realistically, you know, the, the oil and gas industry is probably the most heavily regulated industry out right. there, right. as you can imagine. And if you look at the overall research, 
uh, as far as, uh, you know, our uh, carbon footprint here in the United States has continued to go down. In fact, pollution has dropped close to 80 percent, you know, here in the U.S. Now, and we have about 20 million people here in the U. I I mean, 300 million people here in the U.S. We use about 20 million barrels of oil a day. Mm-hmm. But when you have countries like China and you have countries like, you know, uh, India mm-hmm. that are basically building more coal-powered power, uh, power plants is – Nothing in the pollution stage is going to change until these countries decide, and I don't think they have any issue. I mean, China loves taking our money. I mean, if we're crazy enough to build these cars and, you know, and they build a coal-fired coal fired power plant right next to every one of these EV factories over in China uh, to basically generate the electricity, I mean, they're, they're fine with that, and I think that's what they want to do. But, you know, as far as here in the U.S., I just don't see it happening. Because people don't want to buy them. I mean, people people don't want to be forced to buy something. It's just like taking the COVID shot, right? Mm-hmm. If the government's going to mandate mandate you take a COVID shot, you know, a lot of people are going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. And, uh, you know, as far as these electric cars, they're going to try to mandate that everybody needs to own one, and people just are going to push back against that. That's human nature. Yeah, and who wins in all this? As you said, it's China. China loves this green initiative, this green mandate by our government, because they're getting all our money to build those solar panels and wind turbines. So they love it. (laughs) Meanwhile, they're building a coal plant every week. Once a week, a new coal plant goes up in China. I mean, this is just insanity. My technical term for it is bananas. I mean, it's just yeah. insane. so. So, Mike, you know, I got to ask this, and I asked this last week: is is this really about saving the environment, or is this something else, something more deviant, like controlling our lives? I mean, I look back, going back to the 1960s, and they there have been 41 dire environmental predictions. You know, we had acid rain. We're going to freeze to death in 10 years. We're going to burn to death in 10 years. In 10 years, there'll be no no more ice caps or polar bears. Um, we're going to be overwhelmed by flooding, earthquakes, hurricanes. I mean, you go down the list, and do you know the success of every single one of those predictions? Zero. Not a yeah. single one of them have come to fruition. Not one. And yet we spend trillions of our own money, our taxpayer dollars, on these, quote, solutions to problems that do not exist. I mean, we, we, we destroy lives, we destroy our economy, we destroy families, we destroy businesses. These are all fear-mongering smoke screens. I mean, it's really disgraceful. So, so as I asked earlier, is there something bigger going on here? Well, certainly there is. I mean, there's <clears throat> obviously some people are making a lot of money because when you, as, as, as you said, you know, as far as all of the hurricanes and the tornadoes and stuff. I mean, realistically, it's because, you know, people are building more homes next to areas <laughs> that are very susceptible to to severe weather. You know, I mean, if you want to live on the Florida coastline, yeah, you're going to have more hurricanes, you know, if you want to live. So, you know, it's where a lot of people are starting to live, but it makes the news now, you know, simply because there's, the population is continuing to grow and they, they want to build on these really nice areas next to the ocean. And, uh, so, and, and and it's just a fact that, you know, that a lot of these jobs that were supposedly green jobs that was going to be uh, generated from this new Green New Deal and the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, when you look at it on all of these offshore wind companies, you know, the majority of those companies are international companies mm-hmm. and they get subsidies from the government in order to build these wind turbines. And you've seen more recently, like in the last couple of weeks, where a lot of these big companies are going back to the government now and saying, hey, we can't we can't build these solar panels. You know, I mean, we can't build these wind, these offshore wind turbines because it's too expensive. Yeah. We need more. We need more money. We need more subsidies. Mm-hmm. And I was talking with a guest earlier uh, about these windmills. And, you know, one of the ways that these companies get around these wind turbines is that they change the blades out. So you get subsidies for every 10 years. And if you if you change your blades out in that 10-year period, then you turn around and you get new subsidies from the government. 
So they go in and they change these blades out, even though they're they're not at end of life, and it creates these huge, you know, fields of debris that are basically, you know, <laughs> just deteriorating. Because when you look at a Say, for example, a solar, you know, a solar field. If you look at one natural gas fired power plant, uh, it takes 640 acres of solar panels to generate as much electricity as one power plant, gas fired power plant. Wow. So just imagine the footprint on the on the surface that this is going to cause and, and going to continue to cause. So in my mind, you know, obviously, it's it's just the biggest transfer of wealth in our in our history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and once again, the little guy takes it takes it on the yeah. chin as always. So, Mike, I want to get to how people can take advantage of of where the market is, how they can make money in an oil and gas. But before I, I have a macro kind of economic question for you is is on the dollar, bricks, and and how that how that relates to oil. So oil is traded in U.S. dollars, just like any commodity is around the world. So countries have to convert to the dollar in order to buy and sell oil, right? And now we see BRICS, which is this conglomerate of five major countries. It's an acronym for those that don't know. It stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And these five big countries have come together and now – I think 30 others have signed on to be a part of this. They want to create a currency, a worldwide currency backed on backed by gold and replace the U.S. dollar because you can't blame them. Um, the, the U.S. has overstepped its authority with its dollar dominance, putting s sanctions and restrictions on other countries because they didn't like how they behaved. So these countries are saying, well, why are we beholden to the United States when they can turn off our currency in a second? Why don't we create our own? Secondly, the U.S. Has says they are out of the oil industry. So why are we trading oil in a U.S. dollar when they don't even want to be a part of the oil industry? I mean, that's certainly Saudi Arabia's take. So, Mike, if this happens and we see a replacement of the dollar, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's gradual. In fact, last year I read that 20% of all oil transactions were done in non-U.S. dollars, and that number is slowly creeping up. What happens if this BRICS does come to fruition or if we see a drop in the U.S. dollar? What does that do to the oil industry? What does that do to the economy? Is that, is that a concern of yours? Well, of course, you know, it's always a concern. I mean, obviously, if the dollar collapsed, then, <laughs> you know, it, it, it would be have a great effect on here in the United States. I mean, but I think a lot of these countries, while they are trading oil, you know, some of their oil for the yuan and, and some of these other currencies, I think they do that primarily because China is the biggest buyer of their crew of their product. Uh -huh. So obviously if you've got a huge buyer and he's telling you, you know, that you you want he wants to buy you use to trade it in their currency, then obviously you're going to try to keep that 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 customer happy, so you're going to sell some of your oil. But some of the stuff that I read, you know, from uh, on Saudi Arabia about bricks is they are willing to trade some of their oil for the yuan, but when it comes down to it, they want the dollar to be, you know, they, they will continue to, the most of their oil will be sold in dollars mm -hmm. because obviously who wants China, you know, a communist country to control the yeah. world currency. Yeah, that's why that's why I push back, like you said, on the, this whole BRICS thing that this thing is going to collapse the U.S. dollar. I think there are other things that could collapse the U.S. dollar, right. but I have a hard time believing that suddenly that there's going to be a partnership between India and China, two countries that yeah. hate each other, <laughs> and that they're going to trust each other in creating a currency, and then they're going to basically really hurt the relationship they have with the United States, which is so important to them in so many ways, economically and militarily. So I have a hard time believing that this BRICS is really going to wreak havoc. I do think there's other things going on in our economy that that could. Um, yeah, no, I agree with you there. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the debt that we have is yep. just out of control. Yep, absolutely. So, Mike, in the, in the time that we have now, can we kind of shift gears to the investor? And um, and I know you offer invest in, in investment opportunities uh, for your clients. We'll talk about that. The oil industry has been sort of in a rut um, for the last few months. As I said earlier, oil prices have dropped to around $71 a barrel per share now. Back in July, I looked, they're in the roughly 90s. And so they've fallen a little bit. Um, I did read in Barron's today that one analyst, uh, an oil expert analyst, 
says 2024, we're going to see a big rebound. And I'm actually cautiously optimistic about the economy of 2024 as the Fed starts to lower rates. Now, I think they're doing it politically, but it doesn't matter. It's going to it's going to rise a lot of boats, namely stocks yeah. and so forth. And, and I think that's going to create even more demand for oil, which is going to be very bullish, very positive for oil stocks. And, and, and he picked three stocks that he likes, um, Exxon, Shell, and uh, uh, BP. Um, and he sees a 20% rise in those stocks. What's your take on that, Mike? How should people invest in oil? I know there's different programs for different levels of wealth. Maybe you want to talk about that. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different ways to invest in oil and gas. I mean, some of the main ways, obviously, is like you just alluded to, is buying stock. Mm -hmm. Now, we sell direct participation in drilling programs. Mm -hmm. So our programs, we, we try to diversify our investors' interest or his investment over 20 to 50 to 100 wells even. And how we do that is that we buy non-operated working interest in these shell plays up in North Dakota and Oklahoma and in Texas. And uh, so we try to own a small interest in a lot of wells because there's, you know, the one thing about the, the shell plays is that, you know, it's, you're, it's, you're drilling into an organic rich rock. Mm -hmm. So it has oil and gas in it. So every well is going to be completed as a producer. I mean, every well is going to produce oil. So where are my risk? So when you look at risk, you know, there's two risks, primarily risk. And the first one is the price of oil. And the second one is how much oil you're going to produce. And uh, so what our what we do is we we try to be in the fairway because in all of these plays, for example, take the Bakken. The Bakken covers 250 miles east-west and 125 miles north-south. It even goes into southern part of Canada. So so as I was saying, you want to be in the most productive areas. And that's where our team comes is. We, we have our own team of geologists, engineers, land people. So we're currently evaluating all of these all of these wells that are getting drilled. So we can go out and we lease land. So every one of these wells, they're, they're drilled on a, they put two 640-acre tracks of land together. So you're drilling on a 1,280-acre drilling unit. Hmm. And so each one of these wells cost about $9 million a piece if you were to drill one of them and, uh, and take 100% of it. So we try to we, we go in and we'll lease up to 120 acres inside that drilling unit. So effectively, we own 10% of the well. Mm -hmm. So when an operator gets ready to drill a well, he comes out and he, he basically runs a title opinion just like you would on a house, and he determines who all owns the leases. So they send out an invoice or an AFE, we call it in our business. And so once we get that, if we own 120 acres in that drilling unit, we, we, we participate for a million dollars in that well. And so, you know, our since these wells are $10 million a piece, the wells have to produce about 200,000 barrels of oil to get your money back. So you want to be in areas in a fair way where the wells are going to produce a half a million barrels plus to a million barrels of oil. So that's one of the risks, and that's how we evaluate that, and, and, and we try to be in that fair way. The second risk is the price of oil, which we can't do anything about. We don't have a crystal ball. I mean, once the wells start producing, we can hedge our production, or we can buy you know, co costless collars where basically we get a floor on the price that the price wouldn't go below that, but mm -hmm. you can't do that during the drilling phase. Mm -hmm. So take, for example, during COVID, you know, what we call the lifting cost, what it cost us to produce a barrel of oil in one of these horizontal wells is about 35 to 40, $35 a barrel. And uh, so oil has to be over $35 a barrel for us to make money. Mm. If you look during COVID, when oil went down to $20 a barrel, we were still, we were selling oil. We just weren't making much money or wasn't making any money as a, fa a matter mm -hmm. of fact. And uh, so, you know, we, we basically, you know, have to have prices above $35. Mm -hmm. And that's why I don't think we're really going to see prices go below $70 a yeah. barrel. I mean, you know, I know you, you hear, you know, a lot of people get on there saying, well, oil was $40 a barrel, but that was during COVID. Mm -hmm. And really, if you look before COVID hit, oil was already going back close to 70. Mm -hmm. So Saudi Arabia, the U.S., we have to have these prices in the $70 range. And that's, that's where I think prices are going to stay, you know, because Saudi Arabia has been very proactive in either, you know, cutting back on daily production rates or, or, or increasing production rates because they want to keep that price at, you know, $80 to $90 a barrel 
barrel for Brent crude, that means that our crude's going to sell somewhere between seventy to eighty-five dollars a barrel, and I think you're going to continue to see that, you know, in order to keep these wells producing. Yeah, that forty dollars, so, that forty or twenty dollars a barrel was an anomaly. That was an anomaly due to COVID. I don't yeah. ever see that happening again. I don't think Saudi will let, let that, or, or OPEC will let that happen again. No, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, they, you know, well. They, they really couldn't stop it because the whole country shut down, you know, as far as that. I mean, the, the, you know, there was, what, 30, 40 percent less cars on the yeah. road yeah. During, that, uh, during that time. And, of course, all the industry had shut down. And I think that was one of the main, reason, main reasons why prices dropped. But, again, the reason why investors invest in our type of product is also you get some very good tax advantages. You know, you were talking about investing in stock. Well, if you invest in stock, you know, you're, you're just investing in – you don't get the tax advantages. So oil and gas, when you're drilling in direct participation, you have three main tax advantages that the biggest one being the intangible drilling cost deductions. That means that everything that is intangible that's used in the drilling of a well and about 80 to 85 percent of the well is intangible. We can take we can write that off in the year that the wells are drilled. And then secondly, is due to the Jobs Act that was passed in 2017, we get a bonus depreciation on our tangible items. So last year it was 100%. This year it's 80%. It's eventually going to phase out unless Trump gets reelected in office, then I think they'll be put back into place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, right now we can write off 80% of our intangible items being, you know, bonus due to the bonus depreciations. But one of the main things is that, you know, you have to come in as a general partner. So basically, you you have to be. Now it's not like real estate. So in in oil and gas, they have an exception to the rule, where you know if you build a, a real estate property and you take the tax advantages, then you have to be an active participant in in the building of that property. In oil and gas, there's an exemption to that rule, where it allows a non-operator, a person that is that 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 is not active in the business to take those tax deductions. So the investors can actually write off 75 to 80 percent of the wells. They can take that against their any form of income if you're a general partner. Now, our programs, they allow investors to come in either as a general or limited. So on our general partners, we carry $25 million worth of insurance per well. So we're covering all of our non-operators. So in, in our investment in any one of these wells is around a you know, the highest is probably a million dollars, and the majority of them are a lot less than that. So we feel we're well covered. Now, investors can come in as a limited partner. They get the same tax deductions as you would as far as being a general partner. But you you can only take that against passive income. So, for example, income that oil and gas throws off is passive income. So they can take those deductions as well. So there's some great tax benefits for our type of investment. That's tremendous. Thank you so much for clearing that up because I had some confusion around that myself. So really, tax benefits, huge tax benefits, the de- the, the bonus depreciation, the deductions, and, and then also cash flow, right? Yeah. Those are the yeah. two oh, key reasons. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's the main reason we're doing yeah. this. I mean, you know, everybody likes the tax deduction, but obviously we want to make money. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, so our our programs throw off monthly cash flow as well. And the good thing about the cash flow is do we also get a depletion allowance, which means that 15% of every dollar is tax free. Wow. Wow. So folks, I hope you're picking up on this. <laughs> We've got a We've got a product that is in high demand. It's not going away. It's at a low price right now relative to where it's been before. In my opinion, this is a great, great time to look at oil and gas projects. And due to the tax benefits, uh, the cash flow, the monthly cash flow, um, and a lot of safety involved just around this investment itself. So, Mike, how do people learn more about you and your investment products? What's the best way to get to you? Other than your podcast, by the way. I don't want to forget the podcast. (laughs) Well, obviously, they can send us an email to REI Energy, or you can send it to Mike at REIEnergy.com. Great. Or you can go to our website, fill out a form at www.reienergy.com, and you can fill out a form, and we'd be happy to send you some information on it. Awesome. REIEnergy.com. Make sure you check it out. It's a really great opportunity right now, especially where the price of oil is. So, 
So, Mike, thanks so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. A ton of great information. I hope you'll be willing to come back sometime in the future and update us on what's going on in the in the oil industry. Thanks, everyone. Always a blast. Again, don't forget to hit subscribe because you don't want to miss future shows. Next week is all about the stock market. We've got a 30-year Wall Street veteran that's going to give you his insight and outlook for the markets. Lastly, please leave a comment. It's always great to hear. Get It's always great to get your feedback, your ideas, suggestions for other people or other topics that you want to hear about. And as always, have a great weekend, everyone. Aloha. Thanks for listening and supporting Full Disclosure. If you like this episode, remember to like and subscribe and follow Full Disclosure. To make a better financial plan for your future, join our Cashflow Bootcamp, where John shows you a safe and smart way to turn your investments into a steady income stream in a fraction of your time. Learn to make money in any market. Until next time. This podcast is a presentation of Rich Dad Media Network.